So, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today a uh, speaker, this is Daniele Giudicone. Daniele is a physicist uh, by training and got his PhD from University of Western Brittany, France, and is now a research scientist uh, at Stazione Zoologica Anton Dorn in Napoli. And the title of the talk is Understanding the Structure and Functioning of Ocean Microbiomes Toward a Holistic View. And thank you, Daniele, again for coming. So thank you for the occasion to give uh, the, this seminar. I'm uh, particularly happy to, to talk today here because I have a sort of depth with uh, the generation of Emilio and Cristobal, because when I was very, we were all very young. I participated in, <laughs> it, yeah, I will not tell. Yeah, no, we are still, no, we are now young. Before we are very, very young, right? And. Uh, but uh, yeah, I participated to some summer schools and uh, we were very inspiring because it was this group on transport in uh, atmosphere and the ocean it was really inspiring. And um, so um, I used to give this seminar to, to biologists and ecologists. So I tried to reshape things to interest uh, physics. So uh, I'm sorry if maybe I didn't succeed. So anyway, today, uh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, give a an overview of what is a state of the art of research in marine uh, ecology and the occasion that is uh, provided by the, the inclusion of uh, genomics as a routine tool for, for um, the understanding and the monitoring. And then I will uh, provide a few examples of uh, results, some uh, stable, some preliminary that can uh, show in that how we have to understand better the physics to have an explanation for the results we are having in, uh, in advanced biology. So the, um, the subject is the ocean. I'm actually a physical oceanographer by formation, but since uh, almost 20 years, I work in a marine biology institute, Stazione Zoologica. So today, basically, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the science. We need to have a sustainable explanation of the oceans and to protect them. Okay, uh, And there are some specific uh, societal urgencies we have to address. And uh, we need some science, important science to, to address them. So anyway, um, the reason for that is that uh, we have to inform the policymakers about how to govern and manage uh, the systems. So to inform them, we have to have this sort of uh, virtual positive loops uh, between uh, the policy, the observations, the understanding of the processes, which uh, allow us to predict and then from the prediction to have the assessment and information uh, flow through to other policymakers. So somehow we have to be part of this process and, uh, and, uh, and I will illustrate how it is difficult actually. So the focus will be on the oceanic microbiome. This is a very recent uh, definition actually. So we call this, used to call this plankton, uh, but um, but uh, so a microbiome is basically all, all the small critters that lives in an ecosystem in general. So we have also our microbiome. And in the case of the ocean, we are talking about viruses, bacteria, and unicellular uh, organisms that live in the ocean. They are typically very small, so invisible uh, for us, but they cover actually a huge range of scales. <clears throat> and uh, actually we also consider including this definition the metazoans or the animals that, that feed upon the others. And um, so those organisms and their interactions are defined as the microbiome. Uh, the microbiome of the ocean is very important because it provides a lot of services to society. So from the, the digesting the pollution in a sense, in a way is the base of the food web and also is a contribute to regulate the climate. So it's, uh, it's very important to understand its uh, functioning uh, so these are the oceans, and uh, this is a view of the oceans where we see we are looking here the mean chlorophyll content of the ocean, so the, the green oceans. What I, I just want to emphasize is that there are huge gradients, so regions who are very rich in life, in a sense, and regions which are 
kind of deserts, which is a wrong definition, but in a, in a way, a kind of deserts. And uh, interestingly, they correspond to the regions, the latitude corresponds to regions where the actual deserts are on land. So <clears throat> my point today is that uh, this, the, the dynamics of this system has to be coupled with uh, a description of the physics of the system. First of all, is transport. So why we have these, these uh, we use these images where we have about the chlorophyll on land and on the ocean. While on land, obviously trees are not moving. On, on the ocean, this system is continuously flushed out by, by strong, important, fast ocean currents, okay? So what I, my, my main argument today is that we, most of the theoretical uh, and the practical ecological applications are based on the terrestrial view of the system, while in fact, the two systems, land and oceans are completely different. And so we need to redefine the, the conceptual basis of the oceanic, about the oceanic ecosystem. So what I push forward is that we have to redefine the concept of seascape as opposed to landscape as a theoretical, as a theoretical framework. In addition, as we can see, if we zoom in, as I will argue more uh, later on, we see that there is a lot of turbulence in the ocean. Actually, life is organized along tiny, uh, thin uh, filaments. Moreover, uh, our the system is, is a, is a complicated or complex. We will see later if uh, we agree or not on that. But anyway, the point is that, thanks also to our uh, expeditions so that I will describe in a moment, we know now that, that the ocean is really rich in the biodiversity. So this microbiome is very rich in terms of biological complexity. It's not only that there are 10,000 species, but also that each species uh, has developed a lot of biological solutions to, to survive in the ocean. So the biological complex, so the, the complexity of the interaction is indeed very high. And the complexity of the biology of the organisms is also very important. Okay, so each of these species has a set of uh, specific genes, functional genes, which then are translated into metabolites and proteins in, in the organism. So which gives that we have a, a system made of many agents interacting at the same time, each agent is a complex system because of its biology. And finally, again, we have to consider that the, the, the fluid is acting at all scales of the system. So it's acting from the planetary scale, transporting uh, the tracers uh, around the globe, but also at a smaller scale, scale kilometer scale, so acting as a producing Pat, uh, patchy patterns of, uh, of uh, production. And then even at the scale of the organs, so the scale of a few microns uh, up to a few millimeters, the fluid is really important to regulate the interaction between the, the, the organs because the interaction of course at this scale in a, in a fluid which is all highly viscous at the scale. So um, the other point I want to make at least at the beginning, is that so our big question is how marine ecosystems are responding to climate change and how we can predict this response. Uh, the main point is that we need to, to predict how the system is going to change, not only because of the change in the state variables, temperature, mm -hmm. but also because of the cha change in the variance, so the intermittency, for instance, of disturbances, how it is going to, to respond. And theoretically, we should address these three elements, so the, the, to, to really try to understand the resilience of the system, and the three elements are basically the diversity, so how many solutions has the system to, to adjust, the connectivity between the different uh, uh, parts of the system, and the adaptive cap capacity at the level of the organism, so acclimation, evolution, adaptation, and uh, normally in the studies, we have uh, already, we struggle even to address one single point, while we two should address the three at the same time, okay? So again, uh, just to illustrate the challenge. To give you an example, practical point about the ocean is that if we want to understand why, how an ecosystem is going to be resilient to climate change, for instance, in a case that one species got extinct, we don't only have to, to try to, to understand the functioning of the ecosystem, but also the, the connectivity to the other ecosystems, because one of the species can be replacing this, right? But a point in the ocean is that climate change is not only impacting the single ecosystems, you imagine to the Atlantic, the Pacific, but is actually strongly impacting also the connection 
Okay, so we not only totally have to address how it's impacting locally, but also you have to address how the bridges are impacted. What are the bridges? Are the physics of the oceans and the ocean currents. And again, on the ocean currents and connection between systems, another way to see the, the, the same uh, point, the same question is that if you want to understand the, the, the ecology and the, the, the evolutionary aspects of the ocean, we, try, we have to understand where we are in this, uh, let's say, uh, in this schematic. So are, are the different ocean isolated or different ocean regions, for instance, isolated, or the ocean can be considered as, as a, as a well-mixed system. And probably we are somewhere here. We don't know where are we at the moment, but also probably this, this, uh, this is actually something that depends on the time scales you're looking for. So on long time scale, maybe you can consider the ocean as a completely mixed, like I th I'm thinking about hundred thousands of years, but uh, on the scale up to a century, probably we are somewhere here, et cetera, et cetera. So to make a point here, so the challenge is that we have actually three complex systems. So we have the fluid itself, which is a complex system. We have the organismal complexity, and then we have the complexity of the interactions. And if we want to have an understanding, a, a predictive capacity on uh, how the, the system responds, we have to try to address, to phase the complexity instead of simplifying as we have been doing in, in ecology. Uh, but we don't actually don't know how to do. So we have to develop new sampling strategies new concepts and new data science tools. Uh, and that means also in, a, in a, another way to express this as if we want to express uh, the system dynamics in terms of equations, we have to, we have to find a way to relate this to the phenotype uh, characteristics so that in turn are related to the environmental pressure, but also to the internal biology of the, the, the organism, because now, as I will argue, in a moment is accessible. So that what, it, what is changing now is that now the complexity of the biology of the single system, so proteins, metabolites, et cetera, is accessible with the tools we are now using. So going back to the general point on the, the role of the physics, obviously, uh, I don't have to explain to you the role of transport, of, of course, in the dynamic of an active tracer. This is an equation describing, for instance, the simplest equation we can have describing the plant dynamics. Uh, but it had two implications of uh, the fact we are in a fluid. One is that we don't know actually when you sample the ocean in one place, we don't know if the species was actually thriving there or was actually maladapted, but just transported by, there by, by the currents. But also is that if you ever want to have an understanding of the system, we should actually have a system where we have like, like thousands of these equations together to solve being together. So of course the challenge is there. And this is relevant for the response to climate change, because for instance, uh, one problem with the ocean is that, so we generally, the impact of climate change of single species in general related to where are the optimal temperature for the species where you are, where are in, on land, right? So the optimal range of temperature here is somewhere in the, on land and then the, the species is there. There is this sort of assumption. In the ocean, this idea of optimal wind of regional wind of is not easy to, 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 to apply because we have ocean currents. So maybe, so isotherms are displacing toward the poles, for instance, in a climate change, but depending on the direction, local direction, the currents, you can have that the, there is a, a synergic uh, effect or there is a anti-synergic effect if combining the change in the isotherm, the, the, the isotherm displacement on land, uh, on, the, on the system and the direction of the currents. The other point is that if, uh, if you look, this, uh, this is a very nice exercise. So basically the ocean was covered by particles, okay? And that those particles were integrated before 500 days. And if you look at the mean temperature of in each point, comparing the Eulerian mean temperature. So if I was staying there together with the, uh, compared to the Lagrangian temperature. So this, the, the temperature experienced by, by the organism was transported around. We see that we have differences up to eight, uh, even eight degrees, which says again that it's very difficult to define an optimal window at the level of the organism because the organisms are moving and moving, they experience a much wider range of temperature than if you look at a system as a as a as an uh, Eulerian system, so localizing space. Uh, so <clears throat> The, in terms of sampling and trying to sample the ocean to understanding, so the main problem again is that it's a fluid. I don't have to 
to convince you, but in the case of ecologists, I have to convince them about this. It's very hard to understand that. But so basically, if I want to understand the dynamic of the system so that I want to have an understanding of the process in time, obviously, because I'm in a fluid, I've also, I'm using, I have to, I'm consuming also space, right? So while I'm, while I change in time, I'm also using space. And this coupling is something that makes very, very difficult to sample the ocean in a way that allow us to understand the dynamics of the system, okay? This is the main challenge uh, from my point of view. That's why I, I, I'm saying that I think we really have to work together to redefine the basic concept of the seascape because it's absolutely not the terrestrial system. Uh, an example of why this is a problem. One problem is that, so how do we do the, our climate change projections? No? We, we basically simulate with the IPCC, for instance. So we simulate the, 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 the Earth system, so the physics, the biogeochemistry, until uh, with different kind of level of uh, uh, radiative forcing until the end of the century. Then we take these uh, solutions, so the temperature and uh, I don't know the, the nutrients in the ocean, and then we, to know where a species is going to be at the end of the century, we use a statistical tools to define the niche of the, the organism, so the optimal condition, and then having the projection on how the temperature is going to change, how the nutrients are going to change at the end of the century, we say, okay, given the optimality, the optimal windows of this species, the species will be displaced there, okay? So for instance, if you assume that trees are depending on the precipitation, so we, we, we look at a change from the projections in the precip precipitation patterns, and we have a guess of where these trees are going to be there. There are many, many problems with this approach, even if we have thousands of paper uh, about this. Of course, uh, one of the problems is that this system is absolutely not uh, so simple. So the trees are actually under the control of elephants, not of the direct precipitation. So we miss elements in the network of interactions. But uh, one point is that what is the definition of niche in a fluid? It's not clear. So basically, if I, this is the Gulf Stream, okay? It's a picture from uh, the sea surface temperature. And this is the Gulf Stream. In, uh, so we have Florida. So you see that a very fast current. So if I, if I measure here a population of plankton, and I ask myself, why, what are, why is there? Why, what are the optimal conditions that promoted the species to be there? I actually have to go back in time. But to go back in time means, for instance, by one week, only one week, I have to go back to Florida. So I have to ask myself, what happened in Florida one week before? Okay, And as you can see, this is a very difficult from a particular point of view. It's, uh, you can understand that. The second point, so there is a memory, memory effect we don't know how to, to evaluate, but the second point is that the steering and mixing along currents makes the, the, the niche that they're actually not well separated, they are overlapping and above all, they reduce the number of available niche and it becomes more a continuum, more than something where you have one species adapted to some regimes and, uh, and another to another one. Um, the other consideration I want to make here is that uh, we want the other assumption we do this kind of projections into the future is that the, the dynamical link between the climate and the ecosystems is stable in time. The dynamics is stable, okay? We actually have no evidence for that. So i just show you an example. This is the, the relation between uh, sea surface temperature and uh, salmon catches in North Pacific. And it's very interesting to see that before and after the 90s, the relationship between the two factors changed, okay? So there was a linear, strong linear, linear coupling between uh, the, the temperature of the ocean and the catches of salmon, but actually after that period, the dynamics of the system switched to another dynamical regime. And so there is no more any relationship. So we cannot assume that in the next decades, the system is going to have a, a stable dynamics. So regarding, I was mentioning at the beginning, so the main point today is that we are living in a revolution in, the ocean, in oceanography because uh, we used to go with, standard cruises, but above all, we used to measure state variables, temperature, chlorophyll, biomasses, et cetera, et cetera. What is interesting now is that now 
we can do actually environmental genomics. So basically we are exporting to the ocean what we do in, a, in a human health in the hospitals, okay? We are using the same tools. So uh, basically what do we do? We filter the water, we take all the organs together, we make a soup of DNA of that. And this DNA is, uh, is split into small pieces and then it's sequenced. And then there, is, there are powerful software, bioinformatic software that allow us to rebuild together piece of strings in a way that you can then have genes and uh, from those genes then you can have a, an analysis that allows you to associate a taxonomy so what species is bringing it, and the function to the genes this is um, and specifically what we can have access now is that we can have access to metabarcodes which means uh, the pieces of genes allow us to do a taxonomy so is there we can actually sequence the entire genome of the species so we can have access to the metabolic potential of the species. And importantly, we now are doing also the sequencing of the RNA in the environment. RNA is so what we genes are actually expressed, used in that environment. So we can, we can now characterize the metabolic state of the species in the environment in that specific condition, temperature, nutrient, lights, and so on, from the expression of genes that are in, in, in the organism. So this is creating a revolution. And uh, this, uh, as I will tell you in a moment, so we did a series of expedition which are building upon older expedition like the Challenger more than one century ago. And uh, with this, uh, specifically with this expedition we did uh, <coughs> uh, about 10 years ago, what we did, we went all, all over through all over the oceans. So it's a big, huge international team led by uh, uh, Eric Kersinti. And basically what we did, we collect, we sampled the ocean at three depths. So, so from the surface to mid depth and we sequenced everything in terms of DNA and RNA there. Also adding hydroput imaging to try to have the phenotype of this uh, species. So we, we created the first genomic descriptions of the oceanic ecosystems in a way. Um, this produced a lot of papers, but I don't, I don't want to, to talk about it, but uh, what is important, it describes the first uh, complexity, the first description of the complexity of the biology of the ecosystem. That's, uh, if you want, is the, is the main product of this exercise. And this made, uh, so, uh, um, so Rick Carson T who led, who developed the idea, led the expedition is actually a cellular biologist, a cell biologist, lab cell biologist, okay? is the one that for the it was the first that described the dynamic of internal of the cell as a, an emergent property of the interaction between physics, chemistry, and genomics, okay? So what it, it, in his intuition and uh, as a result of this exercise, he came out with a vision, which is, I think is, uh, is for us, it's, uh, it's fascinating, but it's difficult to demonstrate is that so it's the, the, basically the oceanic microbiome is a self-organized system, which is modulated by fluid, the, the water, which is forced by another fluid in the atmosphere, where the self-organization is actually the progressive complexification of life, okay? So you start with a very simple molecule, organic molecule, that then for some reason you have a second molecule, and then they start to interact, they're producing a third molecule and so on and so forth. So building a, a complexification through this process. And, uh, and in fact, maybe one of the main general conclusion of this exercise of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this expedition is that many, many biological solutions we, we found in humans and a more in a higher level uh, organisms were actually developed by already by unicellulars living in the ocean. An example is the uh, dynamics of, I uh, used to give is the dynamic sexual reproduction. So, uh, spermatozoa you know, swimming toward an oocyte is actually the optimal way to find in a fluid, in a liquid, in, in the water, to find the target, okay? So if you have two try to swim to, to search for each other, it will be too complicated. So the optimal thing is that you have something big, uh, steady, that emits a chemical signal and someone else is looking for it, okay? So actually the spermatozoa approach is something that diatoms in the ocean developed millions of years ago to reproduce. Uh, and diatoms are algae, okay? Algae already reproduce in the way we reproduce, okay? Just to give microalgae, just to give you an idea of uh, how many complex uh, behaviors, biological behaviors actually were from there. So one of the results we had 
which I will mention briefly because I know you work a lot of networks, is that we try to taking the co-occurrence of species across the ocean or genes across the oceans. We had the first description of uh, the network of uh, putative interactions in the ocean, which later led to an analysis focused on trying to find the some networks, modules of these interactions uh, to associate them to the to the carbon export in the ocean. So there is a first description of how, which kind of organs, which kind of interactions are fundamental to, to explain how the ocean, uh, the biological component of the ocean uh, produces sequestration of uh, carbon. We have uh, other recent results uh, published just a couple of years ago on how the network of interactions in the ocean uh, are built. My point uh, today is just to say that uh, what is interesting for us now is to say, okay, this is a, this built from concurrence in space. Okay, I sample the system in different places. I look at concurrence in between species, but it's a description. So it's an emerging meta network from my point of view. It, so what is the, the, the actually the dynamics that is behind the system? It's completely unknown, but also, Many of those species are together just because of physical transport, because of currents, okay? Not because of fancy biological reasons. So if we eliminate the effect of transport here, what is going to be the, the, the emerging network of interaction? Another hint on the, the complexity of the data that we have produced and which require a lot of work, conceptual and practical work, is that, uh, that basically the, the, the main practical result of our exercise is that we found uh, 163 millions of genes in the ocean, and uh, half of them are unknown to, to research. And, uh, and so now we have to find ways to reduce the complexity of this information and to produce knowledge out of this uh, big data thing, because basically the functioning on the ocean is uh, hidden in this, uh, in this number, and uh, we don't know how to, to reduce this. So to, to resume this part, so basically what I'm trying to argue is that uh, we have to try to, to put together these two visions. One is that now we can have access to the different level of uh, nesting level of complexity of the system from the biology of the organism up to the global biochemical cycles. But, uh, but still, we don't have a control and we don't know how to cover this vision in terms of uh, nested uh, complexity level with, uh, with uh, what is actually the living in a fluid and that this everything is occurring in a fluid. Um, now, before moving forward, just to remind you that uh, one of the problems we have in applying theories to the ocean is that uh, there is a, a sort of, there is a sort of in the literature, the two main uh, visions. One is uh, the, the related to the idea of niches so that species have functional differences. And so, for instance, climate projections are based on these hypotheses, but actually most of the theories on community structures are actually based on what is, a, as you know, the natural theory of the, of, uh, the ecology. So basically species are actually functionally equivalent and this, everything is based on a stochastic balance between speciation in the community and immigration from uh, uh, somewhere from uh, uh, an outside community. So it's important to one another challenge we have is to try to, to see what uh, where are we in the ocean about uh, this uh, too. Um, so niche modeling, niche modeling, which is uh, as as I told you, is a way where you simplify your system, trying to say these species have been observed in these temperature conditions, in these nutrient conditions. So these are their optimal window. And so if I want to know what, what happens in the future. I basically have, for instance, this is temperature. I just have to measure the temperature at the same time, define my niche, and then I, I take the predictions for temperature and so on. I can tell you in the future where is going to be the species. This has been uh, um, used many times. For instance, we have, uh, using our data and using the similarity between the metagenomes so the DNA in the different regions of the oceans, we produce the first biogeography of the ocean which basically we split the, re the ocean into, we clusterize the ocean into regions where more or less the, there is similar communities. And so the colors are uh, clusters, okay? So this is basically, so these are all the smaller than 20 microns. So basically we took uh, 
the DNA in each session, and uh, we, we see the similarity, we check the similarity by the entire DNA of the community. Okay, it's a meta DNA somehow using a jacardic, so it's basically using it, the similarity, a similarity two by two, and then clustering this, we obtain these sort of provinces where, which are more homogeneous somehow in terms of uh, genomics. And, um, and then we model these uh, provinces in terms of their niche associated to each one. And then we were able to have a, sorry for the quality, to extrapolate a global level what where these provinces were. Okay, this was published recently. But there are many problems here. And one of the problems is this: is that in fact, if I now I take the same data, okay, but I also take the information on the physics. So I put particles at each stations and I store the time needed to go from one station to another for the possible couple of stations. Okay, so now I have the information I'm traveling in the ocean and how much time I'm measuring how much time I need to go from one place to another place. If I now take this similarity between couple of stations, okay, and I plot this as a function of travel time, the time I need to go from one, to one station to the other, what I obtain is this figure. Okay, I do you understand what this is. It's a bit complicated. Okay, so, so each point is a cup, it's the similarity between two stations. Okay, and uh, on the x axis is the time you need to go from one to the other station of the couple. Okay, so what happens here is that we find an exponential decay in time, which is, uh, which is impressive to me for, for, for two reasons. First, the most important one is that we can actually have a can have a Lagrangian view of the same data we used to, to develop a biogeography and apply the niche modeling before. So we use a terrestrial approach before. Now, considering the reality of a fluid, we can have a, actually also a coherent picture of a system that we described as a patterns like deserts, forests, and things, okay? And uh, the other, so that means to me, my bad me wrong, is that here is where is the dynamics, right? This is the dynamics. So I'm moving with the currents, I'm a community, and while moving, I'm transforming and changing myself. And there are some processes that are producing this change, and that's the dynamics that regulates this, okay? Is there not, look, please, please. It's a good point. Uh, Good question, but uh, this is a minimum time. So we took the minimum time, assuming that there is a directionality in the system. So you have amazing a current going here from year to year. So you have one sh very short time, and the return time typically is much longer. So we defined uh, this as uh, the minimum of the two. Okay. You know, what is magic of this results, so honestly, is that the simulations were done not with the data, with the real currents that were experienced by the sampling. This is a simulation on the mean currents, okay? So there should be nothing there. It should be just noise. That's why I'm amazed, honestly, because the, the computation is done on a computer, right? So the, the Lagrangian computation, and it's the mean time over centuries, okay? These are snapshots. These are moments where I went there that day, that moment, okay? And I'm comparing the meta community that day, that moment, okay? Still, I see a pattern. So maybe the system is ergodic. There are many, many things, so I can switch time and space. But anyway, the point, the main point I want to make here, so it's, uh, is to me, this means uh, so that I can try to understand the dynamics in terms of a Lagrangian dynamics. Yeah, please, sorry. Give me one second, it's very hot here, yeah. Please, uh, yeah, you were saying, sorry. No. Yeah. 
We did it. Uh, yeah, I see what you. So we did. Yeah, we did also the, the analysis with the, together with the environmental conditions and because of the the main point of the seascape is that the resources and the and the, and the population are traveling together and they are interacting while traveling. So it's very difficult to see where is the dynamics. So we checked for that. And indeed, uh, uh, we found also a strong correlation, uh, Lagrange cor Lagrangian correlation with also the resources. So it's very difficult. So, so my point here, in fact, is not that we understood the dynamics. On the opposite, is we are still do not do not understand the dynamics. I'm saying, but it's a demonstration that we have to move into a Lagrangian to understand the dynamics, even the dynamics of the biogeographies, okay, of Eulerian uh, study patterns this is my, so there, it's just a starting point, not uh, the end of the story, but I have to tell you honestly that if you want to publish this statement, it's very hard, okay, so you'll say, no, we don't understand this because you have to move into this framework and then you get into pain, but uh, okay, uh, but yeah, so, so with the other point I want to make here is that uh, the time scale, so the, this Critters they divide once per day, okay? So the growth rate time scale is 24 hours. So where is this coming from? Okay, so this is a huge time scale, right? So is this uh, the ocean physics? Is uh, lateral diffusion? I don't know. I'm work, uh, not traveling around. The lateral diffusion is mixing my community with other community. I don't know. But pro what is sure I can tell you is not only the physics, because if you change the organism of sites that we still observe more or less uh, 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 an exponential behavior, but this time the time scale is longer, okay? So there is also an impact of the biology or the behavior of the organism in, in setting this memory of the ocean, okay? This, uh, this memory of traveling through the ocean. And uh, yeah, I, I could spend time, a lot of time on this. I don't want too much, but I, I would be happy to discuss this later on. But uh, this is, uh, what is really nice is that if I go back to the to the to this, basically as you can see, provinces are smaller for smaller organisms and bigger for larger organisms. And I, more or less, the size of the of, of the, the biogeographies correspond to the time scale of the decay, okay, of the memory, which is something that is very difficult to digest for any ecologist. Okay, this is really so basically. What I'm telling you is that, at least in some cases, the size of the biogeography is not the bottom-up control, that's the region because the temperature is there, and that, but it's actually the size of the, the system memory, okay? It's where the system is autocorrelated time, if you want to move into Lagrangian space, okay? Why? We don't know. Probably because also the nutrients are transported. So if I see also the nutrients patches or certain sides, it's also because the current is there, it's transporting there. Okay, that was uh, the main point I want to make today. Now I will present a few, trying to be quick, a few uh, preliminary results we are having now to try to understand the dynamics of the system. One is on the, on the community structure. So community structure, so it's uh, how the relationship between the abundances of species is uh, working in each community. So there, is, there was this nice paper by Enrico a few years ago showing that if I rank the abundances of the species in each point using uh, Terra Ocean data. Basically, you have a power loss or sort of some sort where the, the exponent is actually not varying across the ocean, okay? This is the impressive stability of the structure of the communities. Uh, there was a more recent paper by Jacopo Grilli who was demonstrated using similar data, data from the same expedition showing that actually you can find very uh, general my macrological, macroecological laws using this data and merging this data with the human gut, mouth gut of uh, humans, so and completely different systems. And they all respect uh, the same kind of general distribution in terms of uh, distribution of species, uh, PDF in, in, in time, sorry, in space or in the single stations. Uh, but one thing I want to underline here is that all these theories, especially the one by, by Jacopo, 
they all assume that everything is everywhere, okay? The most of the theories assume that all the critters, the, the bacteria in these cases, everywhere. And the, the fact that I do not observe them here or there, it's just a sampling problem, okay? So they are too rare to be sampled. This is a very important assumption. So, but it's still valid for the oceans. Are you really sure that uh, a, a species well adapted to polar conditions, zero degrees, no light for six months, is also living at 28 degrees in temperature in, uh, in the Hawaii? So that would be surprising, right? So we need to, to go beyond this, uh, this assumption. And uh, another recent results I, I would like briefly to discuss is that uh, uh, if you look at a slope of the, the rank abundance distribution, so another, this is a sad, um, of the, in the ocean, so this is basically the abundance is the probability to observe a certain abundance in a certain station. Okay, they have a sort of power law behavior with a certain slope. If you do the same, we, we to evaluate this for a community in a lake with no currents, you have a different slope. So this is a very recent paper argued that actually what is actually through simulations, so it is actually explaining a difference is the presence of currents, okay? But they have a, there is a trick there because they say that this actually chaotic advection in the ocean is producing this. Not diffusion, not uh, steering, not, uh, but a very specific mechanism. So, and I don't think this is the end of the story because carrier advection is absolutely important in the ocean, but it's not everywhere. It's not the main mechanism in, many, in most places. So I think this still remains an open question to be addressed. One work we have been doing on this direction on the community structure, together with Enrico and many others, with the Samir and others uh, co-authors, is that anyway to try to see if, uh, if we do take the samples uh, in different uh, communities, can we use a neutral model or neutral approach to do a downscaling so that is we fit the, the, the distribution of the abundances at the most abundant station in the ocean? And then using this fit with a, with a theoretical downscaling, can we predict how many species I observe in the other station? So I don't, so basically I, I do a theoretical fit to this distribution. I derive a theoretical prediction for the richness of species in the other station, which are less abundant, less rich. And in fact, using this, I can find a very good correlation. But what is a surprising result is that if we look at the details of the deviation between the prediction, the theoretical neutral prediction, and the, 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 the actual richness, we found the biogeography. Okay. So the deviation is not purely noisy, but there is a, so this neutral simplified approach, which is working to the first order, is actually showing us also that the, the, there is a regional deviation from the behavior. It's not, no, it's not random, okay? So basically the ecology and the physics of the different systems is actually creating, remodulating the, the, the shape of the, 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 the community structures. Another evidence about the role of the physics is uh, from a paper we, we published uh, a few years ago. So here, the question we're asking again is, uh, what is explaining the number of species you observe in the different places in the ocean, okay? Is temperature, is the abundance of nutrients, is someone else? And what is interesting is that uh, if you look at, so this is the temperature, so each dot is, a, is a, with this a machine learning exercise where we basically look at the role of each of the different elements in allowing for predicting the number of species there. Why am I showing you this is that in some places we have the so-called hydrodynamics that seems to play a role, okay? What is the hydrodynamics here is the Lyapunov exponent, the local Lyapunov exponent, okay? Yeah, sorry, this is a bad, you know, this is in ecology is difficult to explain this, but this is temperature and salinity. Okay, and this is hydrodynamics. I'm sorry about it. I do apologize. But uh, so basically, the rate of uh, local separations of uh, 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 of the trajectories, let's say, so the the the, the, the structure, the velocity, the local uh, velocity field, is actually can be really important if I want to predict the richness of of the, the system. So there is any effect of or maybe convergence or mixing that is uh, that is there. We still do not understand 
Why? And then, so as I will argue in a minute, we have to go back to theoretical results also from Emilio and Cristobo to, to try to understand this stuff. Um, I want to now to convince you about uh, another important reason why we have to work together on this issue is that, uh, as you know, we have uh, experienced a strong climate change. And uh, because the Western societies, they do not want to, to do the, the right thing, so to reduce emission to zero, there are now billions of dollars or euros invested in trying to find solution to do an active artificial sequestration of carbon, okay? So instead of reducing emission, and sadly, I fear, as uh, argued by this paper a few days ago, I fear that the oceans will be used as one of the main tools. How? Basically, they are planning to do things like changing the alkalinity, so basically crushing rocks, basalts, and throwing the ocean, going with this to change the, the alkalinity balance, so to, to get more CO2. To, we go back to the idea of nutrient fertilization, which is an old idea, but which is stopped actually because of the risk, artificial aquailings, and so on and so forth. So as uh, argued by this very nice uh, opinion paper, we need now to do the science to, to, to give a, to justify in case or not to justify this, because there, are, there is a huge amount of investments that are arriving on this point. One example of what's going on in the science is this. So this is a, another paper which came out like three weeks ago or a few weeks ago. It's a very interesting conceptual paper. So basically, it's a paper on the seascape. And uh, what he's saying here is that, let's see. So they took a global model. Okay, so they have a currents and the carbon, carbon in the ocean, okay, as a trace. Now, they, in this small dot here, and here, so here we are in Brazil, we are in the Pacific, in front of Mexico, they altered the carbon content of the ocean for one month, and then they let the system adjust, okay? Because you created an imbalance of the atmosphere, now the carbon in the ocean is less than one in the atmosphere, you, you suck in where there is imbalance, you suck carbon from the atmosphere. But it's interesting to see that depending on where in the ocean you do the, the experiment or the, 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 the perturbation, you have completely different response curves. This is the deficiency. So you are here, means that you have subtracted all the carbon you have perturbed. And also, as you can see, even only after one year, the, 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 the imbalance has been spread for thousands of kilometers, okay? So it's not the local effect that is going to do the sequestration. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effect that after five, year, five years is covering the entire Atlantic, okay? So it's very difficult of such a nonlinear system to think how is going to be the response. And what is interesting of this paper is saying we have to evaluate the, the efficiency of the response in each point in the ocean, and then put a monetary value to each point of the ocean, because then you can say, okay, I, I will pay you if you use this part of the ocean to compensate, because this is more efficient than this place. So this place has a higher monetary value, okay? This is what is discussing now the scientific community. So I think it will be easy for you to understand that we have to go back to, yeah, but what's going on? So what, 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 is the me what are the mechanisms that from a local perturbation create then this response, right? Uh, so in this direction, there is a, I just want to mention a recent, a recent manuscript by, by Enrico with uh, Mick Folos. So he was been studying more or less the same problem, right? So we have a, a fertilizer patch. And you assume there is strain and diffusion, right? And then you try and you show very nicely that, that uh, because of strain and diffusion, there, there could be a very complete, completely different response, right? And so the efficiency of the response depends on the details of the, the local de details. And what is really interesting is that they show that uh, also that the covariance between the source and the plankton, so the response, change in time. So at the beginning, basically you have a, an injection, a ladder injection of resources you know, that creates a positive response. So they're coupled and then they, 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 cover, they, they switch to a negative, right? Where basically that you had the transfer, I suppose, the, no, the resource into the, the biomass. So you now it's becoming a negative uh, coupling, right? Between the resources. So what we did, what we are doing now is that we are doing high resolution uh, Navistock simulations of a similar system. So integrating 
in space over an eddy, a very large eddy in the ocean. This equation, where remember on the vertical, there is also the light that is uh, limiting the, 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 um, the growth, and also there is a stratification in terms of nutrients, so nutrients are below. And uh, we perturb it with a, with a uh, dipole, the, the, the initial steady state conditions, and we integrated for 80 days. It's very nice to see how the, this vertical velocity in the eddy. Now see the local dynamics is developing. So basically what happens is that you create a Rosby, an internal Rosby wave in the eddy, okay? They start to travel in the eddy. And meanwhile, the eddy is destabilized. And then you have the production of uh, strong filamentation going out from that, okay? This is the, the Eulerian picture of the story, okay? Which is interesting, nice. But if uh, I look at the, this from a Lagrangian point of view, so it will take a little bit of time, sorry. So we put particles at 70 meters everywhere in the system. And now what we see in color are the depth, of, the anomaly of the depth of the particles. So in red, the particles are going up and in blue, the particles going down, okay? As you can see the first, because of this is, uh, internal instability, there is a filamentation and the creation of, uh, because of the outward, outward motion of the fronts, you have a filamentation all around. But in the meanwhile, there is a strong alternance on particles going up and going down quite quickly, okay? Then there is a formation of uh, internal dipole. So it's highly nonlinear, as you know, I hope to convince you, but an internal dipole here, which start to destabilize the system and produce the ejection of vorticity from here. And so there is a coherence, but uh, as, as you know, as you tell me, of course, there is a, this filamentation, uh, and, but it is also at the same time, you know, the vertical movement. So the point here is uh, what, what are the relevant scale here? So the point is that when we look at this, uh, these patterns, we say, okay, you know, there is a vertical movement, there are vertical movements, nutrients are exposed to light, we have a, re a biological response. So you think that you leave the time scale of this process is the time scale of these vertical, local vertical movements, but a plankton is traveling, right? And the horizontal currents are order degrees stronger than the vertical currents. So actually, what, the, what are the time scales of the plankton in this system? And no one has looked at that as far as I know. So in fact, if you look in time, now these are single trajectories and in color I have the biomass and this is the depth, okay? So as you can see, some of them are actually going up, exposed to, the, to light, and so they are getting, uh, but what is interesting here is, uh, is this, the time scale of the variability, which is much, 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 much faster actually than the, the time, the variability of the Eulerian system or the waves, okay? And the reason is that what is actually doing plankton is going very fast up and down on the wave, okay? It's traveling across the wave, no? So the real, what is the real time scale is actually a combination of the, the Lagrangian of, of the, let's say, horizontal velocity plus no, the frequency of the wave, okay? And this is an expression. Please, uh, yeah, it's a biomass accumulation, okay? So you said we're very low because are deep, we are 70 meters deep. So the, you know, each trajectory is, a, is a, the history of a, a water parcel, okay? How it accumulates biomass in the system. And as you can see, it's very intermittent. It depends strongly on the initial condition, but also you, you see there is this, uh, this high frequency pattern, which is again, is, uh, is uh, this, uh, so this pattern here of biomass from, uh, from up and this pattern of vertical velocities is not completely informative of the response of the biology because actually the things are traveling fast around this, okay? Yes. Exactly. 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 So it's like going to, you know, Luna Park. I don't know how to say this in English, but you know, like, uh, yeah, because this, the pattern of vertical velocity is relatively simple, right? This is a positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay, it's a dipole. So you do like this four times. But actually, doing it very fast because the horizontal currents are very 
strong. Okay, so this is the intrinsic time scale, which is not described. I mean, it's not really. And in fact, so if I go back to the figure by Enrico on the covariance, and I, when I see that, so what happens to the first response, which is uh, the covariance between the nutrient and the resource is positive because you are injecting nutrients and, the, and there is a local biomass response. Then where you're starting to use the nutrients, now you see more the opposite, right? Because you have the accumulation of, in the biomass of the, the resources. And so basically, yeah, regions where most of the regions cases where we have low nutrients because they are being transferred in biomass. This is my interpretation, but we, of course, we can discuss. And indeed, we did the same computation with this simulation. It's the green, it's the red curve here, the blue curve here, sorry. So indeed, what happens, okay, we don't have this because we start with no perturbation in the beginning, right? So it's not a fertilization experiment. It's a decay experiment. But indeed, we have a steep, no? Uh, so the, the, the correlation is observed even in a more realistic simulation. But the only thing that is irrelevant I want to underline here is if we look at this curve, the orange curve, is actually probably explaining also this behavior. And the orange curve is the, the coupling between vertical velocity and nutrients. Okay, so basically we see, no? So we see this, uh, the strong vertical, the activation, the vertical dynamics, prompted this, this, and this is the response of the system during the decay. So it, there is more to understand here. But my point here is this, okay? So I think I went back to, to your papers because I remembered them. And, uh, and uh, I think we had to go back to this approach. Maybe we'll discuss later, but uh, I think we had to try to characterize the, the chemical reaction, the reactor in these systems in a way that is maybe generalizing this approach, you know, the, you know, the, the smooth filamental, uh, but to generalize this, to describe from the data, the, the, the dynamics of the system, but I, I'm not going to dig deeper. So a few minutes to, to finish, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, sorry, it was long, but uh, very quickly, just to mention to you that uh, um, I'm now coordinating a large scale uh, project over the Atlantic Ocean which is based on these ideas, okay? That we have to go back to the ocean using the seascape as a new framework that we have to define together. And in this context, we are even adding more complexity to the, the biological description of the system because now we are able to do also directly proteomics and metabolomics in the environment. So the things that, so the data descriptive data sets are even more complex and, uh, just to tell you quickly that uh, we did uh, many expeditions. We are doing many expeditions. One expedition is going to be on, is, is happened, sorry, on the, on the Amazon River plume. So we have the Amazon here, there was a plume. And our working hypothesis is that the reason why the plume that is extended for thousands of kilometers. So it's, it's a, the, the only <laughs> river, not only it's a huge river, but also, the impact on the, the Atlantic is, is extended for an enormous region is because of uh, this is an upspot of chaotic advection. And I'm going to talk about it, but I will be happy to discuss this later. So we did an experiment. We have some very interesting results. Just to conclude uh, on a couple of things. <laughs> One is that, so from what we discussed, I believe we have to, to work again uh, together to redefine some basic concepts. So what are the relevant properties an organism has to have to survive in the seascape? In the end, if you think about how difficult it is living to live in a seascape, because you move around, you change a lot of uh, environmental conditions, and so you don't know who, are, who are you are going to meet because the interaction are regulated by, by the fluids and not, uh, are not under the control of the organism. I believe that the spatial persistence in time and, uh, and the plasticity of the interactions are the two key processes that, uh, or that should explain or should drive uh, as, a hypothesis, as a hypothesis to test our research. And I don't think that growth rates, maximization of growth rates is actually the, the main point for the fitness in this system, okay? Some species, yes, I know you will discuss about this. Some species, of course, some blooming species, but 90% of the species are just trying to survive to the, to the next year, right? Because it's a, such a complex and moving system. So I think we have to 
redesign uh, all this. I'm going to just skip to last. Uh, so I believe, uh, so what I'm trying to convince you is uh, today is uh, we have good, important uh, societal reasons to go back to the science to understand the system as a couple system. We have now a revolution in terms of the production of data, the information we can extract, but at the same time, this revolution producing too many data, a too complex data, too heterogeneous data, so we have to work together for, for a synthesis. And from a conceptual point of view, I think we, we need a general framework that considers the ocean as a, as a specific system. I'm stopping here. Sorry if I was talking too much. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, any question? Video. I, there are some, several things that have surprised me, but I will try to to make the, my question short. First, the the last one of the last things you have told is that you you say that the the ups and downs of the of the in the mm -hmm. velocity field of this eddy are not. Um, I mean, nutrients there are not moving at the same speed as the as the velocity. This this has me. What is the the model you are using? Because in in the simplest model, just the the the, the Euler equation will be just the, that the velocity is moved by the velocity. This is what Euler equation says. Then you have many other factors. So what is what makes no, 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 the, the transport move to move differently from the up? No, no, no. This is uh, no, no. Maybe I. There is a mis no, no, no. There is a misunderstanding. No, of course, this is a passively transported. So these are basically Navistokes plus uh, plus integrating the uh, one phytoplankton, one uh, nutrient. So it's a very simple classical. Now, what I'm trying to mention is that here is that we see a strong correlation between the vertical velocity and the nutrient level. Okay, but it's uh, it's not surprising. The point is surprising in, in terms of the fact that the Rigo was able to predict the same behavior without any vertical dynamics. So sorry, it was, no? So I think, uh, so this is a sort of addition trying to see that, uh, okay, no, just to say that uh, you can explain this as a lateral exchange with the system, but also you may explain this behavior as a, this, uh, these three regimes as, uh, as actually the vertical coupling. So, and it's clear what, which of the two is dominating, the lateral or the vertical? Is there any? I don't know. We don't have time to, yeah, no, good question, but yeah. I don't have the answer. Yeah. Okay. Then a second question is in, in one of the first, uh, one of your first mm -hmm. results, you, you see that there is a decaying correlation between the, the community structure as, as, as a function of time, traveling time. But I, um, I don't know how this is computed, but I imagined that, I mean, when you have a parcel uh, of fluid moving, the nature, the, the you see that the community is changing in time. But is this a, an intrinsic, intrinsic evolution time of the community, or is something driven by the different environments the parcel is is experienced? In particular, the water will be the same all the time. But the, for example, if you are traveling from south to north or north to south, you will experience different solar radiation or, or different rains. Or so, so what determines the, this time scale one, two years? Is something is external environment? Is something inter, some uh, internal I, dynamics or what? I ask. I was asking you, in fact. So I mean, as a, as a such already asked, I mean, we discussed before. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's, um, I mean, my intuition is that one relevant time scale is the lateral diffusion, yeah, okay? So you travel as a parcel and you exchange, and if you look at the time scale of the renewal in most of the oceans, you have many months as a time scale because the diffusion is very low outside hot spots like Gulf Stream or things. That's, this, this could be one contribution. But then who knows? I mean, this is basically the scale of the memory of the populations, right? So because it's a genomic memory. So the, the time you have the same DNA in time, okay? How, time, how For how long time you conserve your DNA if you see the DNA as a vector, okay? Of zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So another point could be just to say fancy hypothesis here from here to here, we have two other hypotheses. One could be behavior and one could be food coupling. So behavior, Many of these critters, which are small animals, small, small shrimps or copepods, these kind of things, 
swim up and down in the water, in the water okay? They spend the day at 200 meters or even more and the, and the, and the, the night the surface to avoid predation. But at the speeds of the currents are much uh, slower at depth. So, so these guys, these guys are actually traveling differently in the ocean, okay? Because this is spending half the time in, basically with very weak currents, and these are full time at surface, okay? Never is never discussed this in literature, but this is something it would be really nice to understand better. But I mean, the, so maybe just a simple behavioral attitude that can change and double the scale, okay? Just because of the traveling, you are slowing, no? There could be another, again, another explanation, which is a, could be just a trophic coupling. So these guys are eating these guys. And if they were strongly specialized, they should have the same patterns, right? But if we see a bigger pattern that corresponds more or less to the to recirculations. So our body's working hypothesis is that also that these tend to be generalists. They don't care the details of the prey. And so their distribution is more regulated actually by, by the residence times in the, in the physical system. While these are regulated more by, by the covariance with the resources. So, you know, nitrate moving, so they are coupled to, so there's a bottom up controlled with steering and is more like a neutral traveling because they are generalists so that they are not specialized in a single species. So there are many, many processes. It's interesting, but what, what is the answer? And now, so now, I mean, we have a PhD trying to well, trying, working on this, but I mean, I think it's, uh, it would be really nice to, to dig deeper in this. Uh... Hi, Daniel, well, thank you very much for uh, this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not objective, but it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, so my question was about the slide you show about the comparison between a lake ecosystem yeah. and uh, and um, I just can you just explain again what is these uh, what are these plots so yes yeah, so this is uh, basically these abundances okay and this is a probability to have a species with a certain abundance okay species abundance distribution okay, okay. so pdf mm -hmm. you know okay for each station for each uh, ecosystem okay so how can you see that uh, Currents are promoting. Okay, from here. So these are data. This is Tara data, our data used by, by these authors. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these are data from lakes. Mm -hmm. And where they see the difference slope. Okay. They then use a coalescent model to, to reproduce in a, in a very simplified analytical uh, jet. Okay. The, um, the, uh, the distribution of species. And then a switched on and off chaotic advection. So basically, the, the jet is uh, oscillating slowly now to produce chaotic uh, trajectories against the case where it's just a jet, okay, or no currents. And they, what is, and they observe there is a change, clearly change on slope when you switch on the current, okay. But a point to me is that they not only switch on the current, they had to switch on the chaotic advection because with diffusion and steering, you know, they are not able to produce this. So to me, it's difficult to, to be convinced that you really need the chaotic advection in every point in the ocean to explain the structure, especially after the Erigo show that this is a general property, right? That the slope is more or less the same everywhere. So and chaotic advection is clearly very important in some places, but in other places it's not important. And in addition, chaotic advection is a property in the ocean on scales of kilometers up to 100 kilometers, not on the scale of the micro scale of the structure. So I think we have, there is still a lot, a lot to do, but it's very interesting uh, hypothesis. So it's a very interesting paper by Simone, but I think uh, there is more. Okay. Other question? Oops. No? Okay, so thanks, Daniele. Okay. I'm not quite really? inside the field this way. Huh? Huh? Very much. Huh? Very What's 